Welcome back guys, I'm Zell, and today we're doing another drinking and thinking with Zell. So you've got nine seconds when the intro starts to play to get your drink of choice. And I'll be right back with you. <laughs> Alright guys, today we're talking about the custom knife world, the production knife world, and that place in the middle. We're not going to name it yet. We'll get to that here in a couple of minutes. Uh, to start with, Nick Shabazz linked an article on uh, over on Everyday Commentary where a gentleman over at Everyday Commentary talked about the custom knife uh, bubble and how it's about to burst. And I do agree with this guy on one point. I do think that our folding pry, bar, pry bars, our Medford Predatorians, and all the knives that that style of knife has spawned, yeah, I do think their time is limited and that their popularity is waning. So does that mean that all these knife makers are going to be out of work and they're not going to have anything to do? Well, no, they're just going to do what people do. They're going to move on to making something that people want. So they'll move to better slicing blades, better EDC blades, and that sort of thing. Will we lose a few? Of course we'll lose a few. That's the way business works. But uh, will we see prices go down in that category? Well, most likely, but prices will go up somewhere else. It's just the way things work. Uh, you know, take an economics class if you haven't. It's, it's just the way stuff happens. So... I don't think that the custom knife world is going away. I think our folding pry bars are going to be minimized in a smaller section of the community and that probably our EDC sized blades and traditional blades are going to be going up in popularity as time moves along. As far as the fixed blade market goes, I, I really don't see a lot of change there. We may see some movement from these uh, really thick blades with uh, really low saber grinds to more useful things, but whenever we're talking fixed blades, some of those blades have a purpose and have a use, so you know we'll just have to kind of wait and see there. But anyhow, I just wanted to address that section of what he had to say, and then from there he reminded everyone that we should be looking at production knives because we've got all these wonderful steels and new designs. And... I agree with him to a point. Uh, if you look at Spyderco, for instance, or uh, the Todd Begg Steelcraft series, or some of these others, yeah, we've got lots of great knife designs out there and lots of great steels. But all those things, especially the Todd Beggs and some of these other things like we're seeing out of Wii and out of Kaiser, they still had to come from a custom knife designer, and that custom knife designer has to be selling some knives. Uh, prior to making a deal with these other companies, uh, Spyderco included here, to uh, get there. So I don't think custom knives are going away because if we leave these companies to themselves to design knives, uh, we'll end up with a bunch of very boring, high-selling, you know, very boring stuff. You'll see a lot of Delicas. Uh, where'd it go? A lot of rat style knives because they're basic they're easy to make and they sell in high volumes you won't be seeing anything interesting like a mantra and so on but, so anyhow i think the custom knife world still has its place uh i don't think it's going away like everyday commentary kind of pushed at and i don't think we need to be headed straight for production knives uh, there's this middle ground, this, eh, it's been called mid-tech. Uh, Ken Onion coined that term a while back, the term mid-tech. And all he'll say about it is it's somewhere between custom and uh, production. Well, Ken, I love you, man, but the term sucks. I hate it. There's no definition there that somewhere between full custom and mid-tech, or not mid-tech, uh, production leaves this huge wide area that doesn't have any definition so here for zellrex purposes whether i say mid-tech low volume production or uh semi-custom they're all going to mean about the same thing 
they're going to mean that that knife has good materials, has exceptional fit and finish, and has had some very good QC throughout the uh, build process. And QC means quality control, if you didn't know. And that is where I think the knife buyer, the knife collector maybe even, needs to be as we move along. Does, does that mean that you shouldn't, if you want one, you shouldn't buy one of these uh, Todd Beggs? I think the current one has kind of a Norse type thing. Well, no. If that's what you want, go buy it. Does that mean that uh, Mr. Barushi, I think his name is, whenever he only builds two or three, that somebody shouldn't buy those knives? No, go buy them. Somebody get those because you will have the coolest custom ever out there. And, you know, you might make a penny off of it. Maybe not, but you'll still have the coolest custom ever. But for most of us mere mortals, uh, that semi-custom realm, I think, is the right place to be. And by the way, I consider semi-custom even some of your Spyderco stuff, your ZT stuff, and uh, some of your limited production from other companies. Uh, as long as the quality control, the workmanship, and the fit and finish are there. And I say that because over the past year, I've ran into some things that really surprised me. We have... Uh, now, wait a minute. You guys were all reaching for that X up there in the corner. Well, it's up there. Yeah, it's up, up in that corner. Or you're hitting that stop button down there because I started to talk about a $200 plus dollar knife. Hang on. First, you're going to want to hear this. And secondly, I, I want to get another economic thing out of the way. Yes, this spider monkey's 200 bucks. This browse we're going to talk about in a minute, it's about 150 bucks. And yes, those, by some people's terms, are very expensive knives. However, I want to explain why they may not be as expensive as you think. Whenever we schedule a flight out of here, and I live, you know, 20, 30 miles or so from Springfield, Missouri. We have an airport in Springfield, Missouri. <coughs> But to fly out of that airport to many places, it costs an extra couple hundred bucks. So, say I was going to fly to New York. I don't know why I'd want to go to New York, but let's say I'm flying to New York. If I flew out of Kansas City, it would be $200 cheaper. But I have to drive to Kansas City. I have to get there. I have to... Uh, put the wear and tear on my car, take the time out of my life to drive for three hours or so, and I have to rent space at the airport to park my vehicle. All these things that I have to do and pay for to save 200 bucks. So in the food even. So did I save 200 bucks? Well, no, I didn't. I probably, at the end of the day, might have saved about 50 bucks if you don't include the cost of my time. And we've talked about that before. Your time is worth something. Your time is not free no matter how you look at it. Because time is money and time is what you own. You own your time. So, no. It would have been a better idea just for me to spend the $200 and fly out of uh, Springfield, Missouri instead of driving to Kansas City. Well, that happens a lot with knives as well. And let me explain. You know, you're all, oh my goodness. But let's take this Spider Monkey, for example. It has 35 VN for a blade steel, made out of titanium and carbon fiber, sculpted carbon fiber, and there's quite a bit of money in that stuff. But the most important part of this knife is uh, the action came pretty much perfect centers up right down the line. That blade steel, that S35VN, I've sharpened it since because I'm anal about that sort of thing, but from the factory, it was darn sharp. So, it saved me a lot of time right out of the box. I didn't have to take it apart and mess with centering the blade. If I didn't want to, 
I didn't have to go and sharpen it if I could have chosen to use it just like it was out of the box. And that S35VN is going to hold an edge way, way longer than this $60 Delica. So that's less of my time spent sharpening that knife. Now, whenever you add all those things up, the time spent centering the knife up and trying to figure out what's wrong with it, the time spent uh, sharpening the knife, and getting the better materials here, is it worth the extra $140? Well, whenever you start adding time in there, everybody prices their time differently. Uh, for me, it starts to become a lot more affordable. You know, instead of a $140 premium to get this spider monkey, I'm probably looking at a $30, $20, $30, $40 premium to get this spider monkey. So, whenever you put things in that different perspective, these semi-custom knives aren't as expensive as you think they are. Does that number look big whenever you look at it? Sure it does. Looks big to me too. It even looks big to Jim Skelton. Go ask him, he'll tell you. But uh, whenever you factor in all the things that you may have to do here, or may have to do more often, the price gets smaller. So, anyhow, mid-tech knives. I said it, didn't I? Mid-tech. Now, Semi-custom knives. We've got stuff like the Hinderer. Hinderer's great knives that worth $425. Well, that's up to you. For me, it was. I have one, and the reason I bought one is now I've got one, and it's just a darn good knife that I'm not going to have to worry about. I can sharpen this guy up and pick it up, and at any time, it's ready to go. It's not going to be a mess. I'm not going to have to worry about going out and beating on it. I can go out and attempt to chop trees down if I feel like it with this thing. And I'm going to be okay. And it's still, it's got slicer grind to it, so it's still thin enough to slice up some cardboard or paper or whatever. And for all those reasons and the fact that it's nice and precision and I'm not having to mess with it, it's worth that money to me. Uh... But where we're really, really getting into some stuff that is just pretty amazing is Browse Blades, and there are some others out there that are doing this. It's not just Jason Browse, but I happen to have some Browse Blades on the desk here. This Virtue that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. One, I'm not sure what Jason does to the D2. I need to find out, because if I decide to use some D2, I would sure like to get it as good as his. Uh, anyhow, his D2 is several steps above what you're getting out of the lower end knives with D2 in it. Like I said, there's some special sauce in there somewhere. But the most important part is these knives came perfect fit and finish. Are there things that I can pick on them about? Sure, but I'm nitpicky. The biggest thing is, is the actions work. The blades are centered. There's no wonky fit or things out of place. Everything is the way it should be. I can take this knife out of the box. Secondly, it was sharp. I can take it out of the box. I can put it in my pocket. And I have a knife that's ready to use right out of the box. I don't have to worry about whether it was sharp or not. I'm not going to have to worry if I choose to. I'm not going to have to worry about sharpening it for weeks, maybe months, maybe even longer than that. If you guys remember this thing, this is your bird uh, raven, I think. Whenever I picked this one up, it was not centered at all. I spent a lot of time messing with this, trying to get it centered, trying to get it off the liners and away from the liners, and uh, I finally got it. And But that took a lot of time, a lot of money, because time's money, remember? And then we have the CTS BD-1 steel. Now, in a budget knife, I like BD-1, but... Is it Jason Browse's D2? No, not even close. Is it S35VN, S110V? Uh, no, it's not. You're gonna have to spend more time with this sharpening it. And I know a lot of you'll argue with me out there on this,
but all the time you spend sharpening those knives. If you had purchased a better steel, you'd be spending less time sharpening them, and you would, in the long run, save money. And I know. I get it. I got the knife for 50 bucks. It's okay that I have to spend a half hour every couple of weeks sharpening it. It all depends on how you want to look at things. Anyhow, guys, that's kind of what I had to say today. I think the mid-tech world, and especially now that Browse and some others are in that world, are semi-customs. These things are knives that are what, at what I believe are reasonable prices if you factor in time and all those other things that you may be having to put into that cheaper knife. Uh, these things are the place to be for the near future for the average knife buyer. And it's a beautiful thing because we're getting beautiful knives that have beautiful actions and we kind of have to move there if we really want good stuff. You know, Spyderco is still doing a pretty darn good job most of the time. But over the past year or two, I've watched Benchmade fall off the wagon. We've had, you know, actions that are loose. Blade grinds that look like a third grader did them. We watched Kershaw with part of their line, not so much their U.S. line, but their Chinese line. You either get a really, really good one or something you've got to send back to Kershaw or back to the retailer. And it seems like it's a flip of the coin on what you get. The ZT line gets better. And it is getting better all the time. And uh, they're very soon going to be in that semi-custom group especially with some of their triple number knives, the 777-999 and so forth. But to sum all this up, we've got the everyday commentary guy trying to tell us that there's this custom knife bubble. Well, for many of us, we don't even care. It doesn't affect us. You know, I'm not paying five or $10,000 for a knife. It doesn't affect me. You know, I wouldn't even pay the exorbitant prices for a hinderer a year, year and a half ago. I waited until I got a slicer grind and until I found one in person at MSRP or below. So that stuff, stuff doesn't really affect us. But the pieces that do affect us are these semi-customs, especially with Jason Browse getting in the game. You know, this Virtue was 200 bucks. Recently, you could get this VR71 at $150. And Southern Grind, Spider Monkey and Bad Monkey, right around 200 bucks. Makes for some really compelling options to stay out of the lower end of knives and to not break into that upper end. And overall, you're getting great knives that you may not get at that upper end, at that custom end, and you're probably not going to get at the lower end. So... Anyhow, putting the economics in place and thinking about the whole big ball of wax, what's your opinion? And I really appreciate you guys stopping by and talking knives with me for a few minutes. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.